Beloved, in Colorado Springs, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Decorations going up, turn on the network news. I see the Christmas tree in Times Square and Radio City, all the decorations. Oh, I tell you, we don't have much time between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we're getting excited here because the decorations are going up here at sunrise, senior living. And we want to keep Jesus as a reason for the season. Remember some weeks ago, about a month ago, we talked about, let's talk about Jesus. And we've been trying to put everything we can in the Christmas as we did for Easter month and our celebration of Thanksgiving. It's difficult really for me to talk about one without the other because when I was pastor through those first years, every church we were decorating during the Thanksgiving with all the uh, beautiful flower arrangements, the poinsettias, you know, everything seemed to be directed. And we get over that in about three months from now, we'll be getting ready for Easter. But you know, beloved, the only thing that really matters, and this difficult day when people are just trying to rewrite history and almost trying to rewrite the Bible, Put their own little twist, you know, the false teachers, the false prophets. It's absolutely amazing to me that people who weren't brought up in the Word of God weren't going to Sunday school, as we say, in most of our denominations. If they weren't brought up in the Roman Catholic tradition, they don't think a thing about going anywhere they want to go, doing just like they always do on Sunday. Now, I've already had my ball game, and there's another one to be played today. The Dolphins are playing. Right at about the time that we're in the middle of lunch. And I want those Dolphins to win. You know the only difference between a dolphin fan and a Jesus fan? It's the excitement that we see at worldly events that we do not see about the season we're now celebrating. We get all excited. We talk about people. We talk about weather. We talk about things that are all that are important at all. But we said three weeks ago, let's talk about Jesus. Let's get him back where he belongs as the center of our focus as we search the Word of God. And if you search in the first book of the New Testament, it all begins with Jesus. The wise man, his birth in Bethlehem, and his flight with his mother and daddy to Egypt. When Pharaoh got all upset and thought, uh, I mean, the emperor at uh, Rome got all upset because somebody was giving him a little uh, problem coming to be king. And you know, they said, remember, we have no king but Caesar. We don't want this man to reign over us. Now, if you read that story, I'm trying to give you a little excerpt here and there from these first two or three chapters in the book of Matthew. He's the only gospel writer of all the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The only gospel writer who devotes the whole gospel to the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. 
Now we have a tendency to put a harmony of the gospels. That's the word we use. And there's a book by that very title, Harmony of the Gospels. Some things appear in one gospel that do not appear in the other. So we know that uh, we need to keep focused on the central figure, the Son of God, who was planned centuries and centuries before it all happened. And it's amazing, as I said repeatedly since I've been here, how searching the scriptures will convince you of one thing, that God's plan was after man fell in the garden, after his creation, fell into sin, walked away from the Garden of Eden in a perfect paradise that God had prepared for him. And now something had to be done and God in his great love and mercy got it all worked out to where we wind up in a garden in the book of Revelation which is called heaven. Paradise lost in the book of Genesis. Paradise restored and regained in the book of Revelation. Now, you know, friends, it's really not that difficult if you'll just take a moment and look up the beginning of each chapter of each book and sort of see how the Lord brings us through and get silent in the last book of the Old Testament until John the Baptist steps on the scene about 400 years later. And that's what we have to remember, that he's the one parallel to Jesus who came to prepare the way for his uh, Savior, just like we do. We have to prepare the way in our heart and John the Baptist said, there's one coming after me who's mightier than I am. Don't be looking to me and praising me. Do you hear what I have to say? There's one coming after me who's mightier than I. The latchet of whose shoes I'm not even worthy enough to stoop down and humble myself and unfasten his shoes. And he had pronounced that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is coming. The very Son of God would be born of a virgin with God as his father and Mary chosen by the Lord, a virgin, of course, to be the mother. Now Mary had other children that came later in her marriage to Joseph. But the one significant thing that Matthew is putting his finger on, it's all about Jesus. Any way you look at it, whether we're reading one of Paul's letters to the churches, telling us how to live in Christ and how Christ lives in us, and how his Holy Spirit came to dwell in the book of Acts. Oh, dear friend, it's a beautiful thing once you put it all together and get it in your mind and in your heart. And I close my eyes while I'm preaching because I can see it all as the Lord has taught me from childhood up to my 90s. And people say, well, you don't look that old. I said, well, friend, sometimes I feel like I'm 200. When I think about all the things that I've been through in my life since I gave my life to him. Because before that, the Lord was preparing me 
as a little baby in my mother's womb to be a preacher. Boy, I tell you, it's a wonderful thing. I've spent these two years that I've been here at Harmony Healthcare thinking and reading and remembering all about Jesus in my life. How wonderful it's been to focus all my attention without being interrupted, except by the telephone. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, these iPhones, I brought it here to remind me. If I had just had that when I was going to college and had the internet and could use a computer, boy, I would have saved myself a lot of money, but I wouldn't know half as much. You know, friends, it's amazing how much is left out of our life because of the Wi-Fi and the internet. We have so condensed it down and put in new exciting features that we almost leave behind the things in history that really stand out about the working of God, the creator and the father of all created beings. Oh, dear Lord, how I pray that you'll help people in America to remember that God sits on his throne He's still in control. And we need to be aware of the fact so when we read the truth, we can apply it to our hearts. And boy, what I ask you today, as you listen to this message, even today as it's being broadcast or later as it goes on the networks that we serve, I pray that you'll watch YouTube above all if you have that app. If not, it's on Facebook, Messenger. It's on Google. You can Google it, Carrie Miller Ministries. And I hate to take time out of this message to repeat this, but until people get familiar with it, we're not going to get the exposure that we'd like to have. So you help us to let people know that we're here to talk about the Lord Jesus, to help people to know him, to not only know about him, but to know him in their heart, in their heart, their life, and all their experiences, to seek his wisdom, to seek his understanding, to know the things of God, as the Bible sets forth all this truth. And beloved, I thank God for the day that I can sing the song, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more strife. Oh, dear friend, even though I've been to church and went to Sunday school, heard a lot of scriptures, a lot of Bible stories, saw a lot of Bible pictures that Ben had drawn trying to illustrate it. You know, we had a picture of Jesus kneeling at the garden. I'll never forget that. My mother had it on the wall. As I walked out of my bedroom, I was reminded that Jesus knelt there and prayed for me. He was praying for everyone that would be exposed to the fact that the Son of God came in a bodily form. Now in my heart and lived among us experiencing everything we are yet without sin. He's the only one that was worthy to walk with the Father. The only one whose holy character 
allowed him to have perfect understanding. The knowledge that he could see for himself, so to speak. It's difficult to put your mind around it. It's difficult to understand how a being, and we don't know where he came from. We just know he always was. That's the hardest thing for me to accept. By faith to believe that the evidence of his very existence is all around me in these Rocky Mountains out here in Colorado. I tell you, it's so magnificent to go up about 14,000 feet and realize that's just the beginning. And see these space photographs of spacecraft going out of sight, out of the reach of our strongest telescopes. You know, it's just, well, it's just too wonderful for me. To read that man was created from the dust of the ground. I've stood at the graveside of many a person, both children, babies, stillborn babies, preached a message to give them hope that the diverse it says, their faces, the children that are with him in, in heaven and paradise, do always behold the face of the Father. They're always beholding him. They're with him right now. And I have the privilege of standing as a preacher of the word of God since I was 15 years old before my 16th birthday, as some of you have heard me say several times, I'm sure, if we've been friends very long, and to know that that same Jesus that came just like God planned and like his son planned. Now this is a mind bender. Let us, U.S., us, make man in our image. My soul and body. You mean Jesus spoke to the Father, the Father spoke to his Son, and the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God, like electricity in the internet, makes it all possible. Without power, no power. Or when the electric shuts down, and we're in the darkness. I looked in my room one day when the power went down. I couldn't see anything. It was so dark in there with the black light, I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face. And out of the darkness, Jesus was there when the Father said, let there be light. He created the ball, the sun and the moon and the stars. I've been saying for two years, there's so much evidence that there is a creator because of his creation. It's so wonderful to know that all power is given unto him. Jesus said this in heaven and earth, the father and the son, being one, he had all power. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. And I used to sit in my bed. <laughs> and I sit there, you know how you do Indian fashion, sitting up with a book in your lap. I used to sit there as a kid. And I'd look at the pictures. 
And two things I'd like to look at. The Sears Robot Catalog and the Bible. I like to walk, look at the pictures. All the things that man was making that were in the Sears catalog. And I'd look at it. And I'd say, boy, I'd like to have one of those and one of those. You know, it was like every other materialistic created being. We're so materialistic that we can't think about the spiritual wonder of God and all he's done. All he has to give us. He has a catalog of promises. It's in the Bible. And we can sing that song. He will keep his promise to me all the way with me. He will go. He has never broken any promise spoken. He will keep his promise, I know. And here sits a little lady, Japanese, of another world, really, to be another continent. And I think about the fact that God created her with a little more color than he did me. My features are a little different than her Chinese parents and her whole culture has been different to what we have in America. And yet we can all live on the same planet and we can all enjoy the privileges of created human beings until we mess it up like we have recently and get back to power hunger and who's gonna run the show, who's gonna be the biggest and who's gonna have the best army and the best Navy and the best rockets, and the most powerful atomic bomb. We got our mind off the creator. We got our mind off his plan and his purpose for this planet to bring glory to God, that every mountain would bring forth in rejoicing, the Bible says. That the rocks and the hills would cry out in the Rocky Mountains with all their beauty. This season we've just experienced, the fall season. Oh, the beauty I saw as I rode in our sunrise bus the other day. And I just almost want to stop the bus and say, let's all get out and bow down down here and praise God. Let's just have a service down here somewhere and say, Lord, we love you. We love you so much, Lord, for all you've given us, for all you've done for us. How could we ever, ever thank you? Now, this was during... Thanksgiving a few days ago. And we were up there roaming around on one of the trips. And she had it all mapped out for us. And we were looking from one side to the other. We didn't want to miss anything. Wouldn't it be that wonderful if we could do that way with the Lord and say, oh man, I got to I gotta look that up. I got to get it. Concordance where I can find out about what God said about love and wickedness and where the good people are going and what they're going to do with the others. Boy, I found out a lot of things that disturbed me when I was young. So when God called me to preach, I said, Lord, I got to take that message. I got to tell people that if they miss Jesus, they're going to miss out on all that that you're 
preparing. I don't know if I like that or not. I think to myself, and boy, when the Lord struck me down on Sunday morning in January, 1947. I said, Lord, I want to be a doctor. And that morning when I sat there and listened to my pastor preach, somebody just spoke to me. Like he may be speaking to some of you on Zoom network and YouTube and Messenger. Because, you know, the same Lord's still speaking. He's still calling people to be reconciled to him and to get back into fellowship and enjoy all that he has. But we think the world's better. You see what we've come to, listening to other people. Well, I just got to have that. I just, have you made your Christmas list yet? I'll tell you what I'd like to have is a new study Bible. One of the most recent with all the little things in the center column as the chapter, the pages are divided, all the references to the Old and New Testament that respond and give light on that verse I'm reading. Man, I don't want to have to Google everything. I want to see it for myself. I haven't told anybody that because I don't want anybody, to, my family, anybody to run out and buy one without me seeing it. It's the one I want. But I have a little Bible upstairs called the Williams Translation that I've mentioned to you. And I'm glad to know it's still in print. And I've marked that thing and underlined it to where. You can't even write John 3.16 in the margin, I don't think, of any page. It's already full. I looked at it the other day, and I thought, oh, dear Lord, how many sermons have I preached out of this little translation? I've had three different copies of it in one size or another. And I still don't know it all. And people say, how, how do you memorize all that? I said, I don't know. I just didn't even know I was memorizing. it. I read it so many times, it just comes to me. And right now, I think about the name of Jesus, as I preach here some time ago, that every knee shall bow before him, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the Lord. And he came down here and lived in a place that I've had the privilege of visiting, and I've seen it with my own eyes. And I read this story earlier today upstairs, and I said, Matthew, I'm going you know, to, not out loud, but to myself as I was waking up, I reached over and got that little testament. And I said, you know, there are a lot of people that don't even love you enough to wake up, get up, come to our Bible study, to have fellowship as a family with each other, to forget denomination and come and just 
Seek your word. Lord, what's the matter with us? That we've forgotten how wonderful you are. You know, in one verse it says, the God of this world, that means Satan, is in control of the minds and hearts of all those who do not know the mind of Christ. They're trying to sell us on what they're selling or giving away. I wonder what they're praying for for Christmas. Black Friday. Everybody looked to see what was going to be on sale just two days ago. They were standing in line before daylight because they know there's going to be a limited number of things that the store owners and the people who make the announcements and the, give them the publicity, the sales pitch, as we say, they're going to put it all together and make it real appetizing. So people will run out and spend what little money they'd be fortunate enough to have left in their bank account. Before we're taxed again. <laughs> but something that comes from Washington, D.C. Friend, I ask you right now, is Jesus the apple of your eye? Is Jesus the one above all your family and friends? Is he the focus? The one who said with his own words, from his mouth he said, if you love father, brother, mother, sister, more than me, you're not worthy of me. I didn't say that, Jesus did. I asked some of the residents here this week, You ever heard that song? Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. You believe that? When you go to buy a new lamp for your bedroom, or some Christmas lights to celebrate the birth of one, really. Who came to tell us, tell us that he's a light of the world? Does that ever come to your mind? When we go out here on the bus in a few days, maybe, if the weather permits, we'll go out and look at all the Christmas lights, all the decorations. Do we remember that the lights is to celebrate the light of the world? How much do our children understand about that? Boy, I was so glad in that Macy's Day Parade to see liquor-free 
commercials. See nothing in there that we're going to take our children to see. Even the dancing and the drama, the songs they were singing. Yesterday morning, I turned on my, well, it was still on, but I turned up the sound because it was muted. And I heard this man selling a new album, a West Country Western singer was singing gospel Christmas song. And he was hoping that some would buy his album and sing about Jesus. I thought, well, good for you, man. That the network was not anxious to keep anything from offending somebody who might not believe in Jesus. Well, friend, let me tell you something. They're going, <laughs> they won't be in hell five minutes if they'll believe it. The Jesus warned and warned and Call men like myself to go and warn the wicked for his wickedness. For if that wicked man shall die, the Bible says, Paul, and you don't go warn him, that wicked man will die. But y'all holds you accountable. Whoa. Now that really gets deep. If thou shalt not turn to warn the wicked from his way, and that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, his blood will I require at thine hand. Now read it for yourself and figure out what he's saying. You know, I talked to all three of my children this week since I preached last week. And they all told me, Dad, even my, my prodigal son, he said, Dad, I've never been in doubt about what you believe. And I know you believe it with all your heart. And he said, Dad, I don't know how you did it. All those hours you used to spend talking to people and visiting people, praying for people, and preaching to people, and all those revival meetings you held overseas. He said, I don't know how you did it. I said, son, I didn't do it. I just let Jesus use me. And I'm so glad he did because I learned so much about his love, his forgiveness, his mercy. And I've warned people. I was the one who, like the watchman on the wall, watching for the enemy who was about to attack. I was the watchman on the wall trying to warn the wicked from his way. Now I want to say in closing today, friend, let this be a warning to you today. If you are tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus Come into your heart. Oh, he wants to come in. He's the one knocking at the door of your heart, and giving you that understanding that there's one who loves you, there's one who died for you. And he went through the most horrible suffering imaginable so you wouldn't have to suffer. 
He wants to come into your heart. He was so forgiving that on the very day they drove the nails to his hands and feet, <clears throat> he looked down and saw the multitude who rejected him and refused him a place in their heart and life. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, dear friend, he wants to come in and cleanse your heart, change your heart. And if you let him, he'll be the driver to control your heart and direct you with his godly Holy Spirit. Like the GPS guides you to your destination. Please don't turn him away. I beg you today. Softly and tenderly, he's calling. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, oh sinner, come home. Come home. Would you hear his voice today? Would you bow your head and say, I want this wonderful Jesus. I want that creator, that healer. He wants to heal. He wants to bless. He made the blind to see and the lame to walk. And he wants to give us a new body one day. No sorrow, no suffering. Don't turn him away. He's the only one that deserves that first place in your heart. There is no other name under heaven given among men. I've got a sermon on that. If you look them up. There's no other name under heaven given out among men whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus. So let's get Jesus on our mind. Let's get others who may not know him in our heart. My granddaughter came and put up my Christmas decorations Friday. She took out the pillow, that little decorated pillow that she bought me that goes with my bedspread. And she said, Poppy, I said, go put that one up in the closet where you got the one we've been keeping. The one that I got playing bingo, remember the pillow? It has three letters on it, J-O-Y, Baptist Preacher. Got a pillow on his bed at Christmas time, talking about Jesus, others, and you, J-O-Y. It's right there. Anybody walks into my room, there's no way they can miss that film. The point zealous. They look so real. Best artificial I've ever seen. And a Tiffany vase that my granddaughter bought me, sitting on the table in my kitchen. to remind me of the decorations that remind me of Jesus. And on the picture over my table, there's a picture of a red bird, a cargo. 
sitting just to the left of that basin on Zedus. And when she got all that put up, I looked around and I said, Lord, I hope everybody remembers that Jesus is the reason for the joy that's in our heart as believers in him, as part of his family, that they'll know that we want everybody to have that joy. That people can see Jesus in us this Christmas and know that he's alive and he loves them and he wants to deliver them from whatever burden or problem or habit. Any grievous behavior on their part, Lord, that grieves him, he can forgive. Bless all those men today that are listening, my friends and my loved ones in Miami, where this broadcast originates after we download it here. It'll always be home to me down there. Where I spent half my life traveling and preaching and letting the world know that wise men still worship Father, I pray today that the world may know that everyone has an opportunity to hear before you return to make us accountable before you. Lord, we don't want anybody to suffer any affliction to be controlled by anything except your Holy Spirit. Lord, there are people all over the state of Florida that have gone, some, gone through some hard days recently. And I know an awful lot of people in Florida love you and know you. And they've been praying too. They may not understand what you know you're allowing to happen in that part of our country. But Lord, help them to be a part, not of the problem, but a part of the solution to get Jesus back in his proper place. Is our prayer in his dear name, even Jesus. Amen. Tune in next week. We'll be here, the Lord willing.